Einstein said the happiest thought of his life um, was when he realised that gravity was an illusion. He, reali he realised that time and space weren't flat and that tangible objects warp themselves. Um, tangible objects warp space and time around themselves. For Einstein, this was an epic win. Um, and for gamers, you'll know, know, you'll know what that is. I'll introduce that in a moment. Um, so this way of thinking for Einstein um, resulted in his general theory of, of relativity. Um, and Sarah McGonagall, she introduced um, uh, on TED and um, the, the, the concept of epic wins, which are um, their outcomes so extraordinarily positive that you don't realise they're possible until you've actually achieved them. So I, I don't think Einstein was, was quite, um, quite thinking what he was on the verge of discovering um, or inventing. Um, but in order for, for Einstein to come up with this great concept, he, he went to great lengths of examining many innovations as a patent e examiner within the patent office. Um, and then he shut out all the noise in his life and imagined himself riding on a beam of light. Now that's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, it, so that's how he came up with the, the theory. Um, so once you free your mind, the concept of innovation is merely an illusion, then anything is possible. Mutation-driven innovations bend our multidimensional culture and markets around themselves. So these are the radical innovations. So what I'm going to do here, introduce here, is some, similar to some other um, concepts today, um, it's the comparison between um, the natural world and the man-made world. So I'm a biologist by training. Um, so we have, um, I think that's the pointer. Yeah. So we have nucleotides, the basic building blocks of, of life, <laughs> and um, and then we have uh, these give rise to these 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 make up genes, DNA and genes, and genes then get read and produce proteins, products, and these proteins then form larger organisms, which is you and I. I can see a lot of organisms sitting in front of me. Um, and then we form species. Species can interbreed with each other. That's the definition of species. And then they form kingdoms. So we have the bacteria, the archaea, fungi, etc. So all I've done is compared the two. I think there's a, there's a nice analogy between this and man-made and the knowledge creation. So we have the tacit, tacit knowledge, the stuff that's in your head that walks out of the room at the end of the day, um, which gives rise to codified knowledge, things that are written down into a patent application, for example, or a, a specification of a product. Then these codified pieces of knowledge get converted into products that we see and we, we feel every day. Um, these are housed within organisations, whether it's a, a private company or a not-for-profit organisation. Um, and then they form industries. And I've kind of said that that's a species because they interbreed with each other, they trade with each other. Um, they pass on knowledge between each other and form new companies. They merge, acquire each other. And, and again, they give rise to the greater economies. So let's move on. Um, so, so some examples of, of what I'm talking about here. Um, so in nature, you, you typically get um, random mutations uh, within the nucleotides and the, and the genes and the, and the base pairs. And you also get replication errors. Uh, when the, the DNA and the RNA are replicating, um, they, they, there's errors in those mechanisms. But there's also repair mechanisms for those, those errors as well, but you get errors in those too. And then you can get induced mutation, which we're probably more akin to what we, what we know, chemical uh, mutation or radiation, such as UV light, so wear, wear sunscreen. Um, so some examples of, of the sort of man-made ones that I, that I can see is... Um, so Alexander Fleming, you probably know, this is the original paper from, from Fleming's lab. Um, this was in 1929. Um, and what he noticed was he left, he left one of his plates on the windowsill. He was studying penicillium, um, which is a, a fungi. And he noticed here that when he got back from the summer holidays, because he was going to clear up his plates when he got back, that the, the, the bacteria around this fungi were being lysed. And this was just random. He was just working on penicillin. He wasn't looking for bacteria. But some bacteria got onto the plate. Oops. Um, so this was a random change in the tacit knowledge of his way of thinking. And obviously that results in antibiotics. 
The other one is an example from the Royal Mint. They produced a quarter of a million coins, 20 pences, in uh, 2008, where they forgot, uh, well, or they, they used the wrong machinery um, from the previous batch. And so they, they were replicating the coins, but just using the, the same machinery. But they forgot to, to change the machines over, and they didn't put the date on. So these 20p coins now, if you find one, they're worth a lot more on eBay than, they are, than the face value. But they're still tender, so you can still spend them. And this is a sort of um, an idea of um, more induced mutation. So this was um, um, a, a session we had at Colworth Science Park, which is not too far from here, um, during the summer of last year. And this was eating with knives, um, or, dine or dining with knives, I think it was, where there was all sorts of weird things going on. Um, but there was lots of people from different, different diverse backgrounds, product development, all sorts of people. And it really did... Um, change the way that of uh, thinking about eating and dining, etc. So um, I'm not going to read there. You can pretty much go through. But the, in, in nature, beneficial mutations are what's important for us as innovators and designers. Um, so a weekly beneficial mutation um, enables the organism effectively to become fitter, and it can uh, and it can reproduce quicker within the population, and that becomes more common. So all I've said is that a beneficial mutation in, um, in innovation and um, design um, enables a new product to exist or thrive in these new markets, and they, they tend to become more common. So very simple. Um, but what I'm saying is um, if you want to design new products, um, then we've got to start at the top. So we have to start with the tacit knowledge and mutate the tacit knowledge, rather than what most designers or most, most people tend to do is just start at the product level and see if we can make a slightly better thing. So in order to get these radical, game-changing um, innovations, we need to start at the top. And also remove some of the barriers to doing that, the 9 to 5 working, the, the you know, everyone has to be 100% productive all of the time. So if we can do this, um, by chance or deliberate mutation of the tacit knowledge within these liquid networks. Um, we can achieve these epic wins, these things that we didn't even think it was possible until we actually tried to do them ourselves. And these mutated people now will give rise to new companies, new organisations within and create new industries. And then they'll be governed by the market demand for these products. So a few examples of these. Um, I didn't get the copyright on these images, so I can't put them up, but you know what I mean. Um, so Lee or Lido Lacoca and Donald Frey from Ford, they, I think it's the 50th anniversary of the Mustang this year, and they created the Ford Mustang. Excellent. So two people coming together from very diverse backgrounds. They generated the Mustang. Very innovative design. Not the, the, the motor car itself, but the design. And then um, Jonathan Ive and Steve Jobs, when he went back to Apple to revive it, the, the first product that arose from that relationship was the iMac. Very distinct design um, and, and change in direction for the company. And also gaming, um, working hard, building strong relationships within the, the, the things that we're doing. This was a session we ran in Auckland about uh, seven, ten, five, six days ago. And this is a, a, a product that we've created. Um, it allows people to, to, to commercialize, to simulate commercialization of intellectual property. And all of these people that were playing were after an epic win, and they did. So you can see on their faces that look, they're loving it. So, so we've got some um, epic wins there um, from these people with the books that they've got. Um, but they were gaming. They, they turned up thinking, oh, we're going to play a game for three or four hours, but actually they really got into it and uh, really, really enjoyed it. Um, so how do we change? How do we go from what we used to do to what, what we need to do? Um, well, first of all, um, we need to game in liquid networks. We need to recognise that mutations are not always bad. Um, so you've, you've probably seen X-Men, and they're always thinking that their mutations are very good. Um, so uh, an example here, this is a, um, an exhibition at the v a Museum in London. Um, so we've got some various interesting mutations that that are not bad, they're good, they're interesting. Um, we need to enable tacit mutation. We need to remove the barriers 
Um, so this is the Berlin Wall again, 25th anniversary of that wall coming down. That stopped the, the movement of people, culture, um, thoughts across two, two boundaries. And also that our school and education system typically weans us off gaming and playing and into uniformity. I think Jonathan um, hinted at that earlier. Um, we need to record and analyse these mutations. We, we can't sort of, if, if a mutation often comes up, we don't record it, we don't look, look for it. We, we sort of sweep it under the carpet and say, oh, no, no, forget about that. That's not useful. But actually, it probably is probably the most useful thing that comes out of the research or the development that you're doing. You need to warp the world around these mutations. You need to make it fit around. Often these radical innovations are not quite ready for the for the consumers yet, but so you need to prepare the market, prepare the, the, the audience for them. They need some nurturing, so it's e really easy to kill them off when they're at a very young stage. And you also need to continuously, continuously refresh, mutate, change your organisation's tacit knowledge, keep refreshing the people within there, the younger people, as again Jonathan said earlier. So we're doing it ourselves, um, you know, we're, we're practising this as within the company I founded. Um, we c we th there wasn't any tools that we found to simulate um, intellectual property commercialization. And we wanted um, IP professionals, students, um, engineers, designers, um, accountants, lawyers, everyone with heavy heads or on, on, on either side. And um, w we couldn't find a tool. Um, so we started um, gaming with our clients and we started using game theory to, to, to give them better strategies. And after that, we developed the, the, the board game itself. And um, we, we're rolling this out as, uh, as a workshop format, but we continuously improve that and get more information back. And yesterday, we reached our Kickstarter target um, of, of £3,014, which I'm very pleased this morning um, that, we, that we reached that. It's still open, by the way, so if you want to <laughs> do it, it's, um, it's very uh, just Google um, Kickstarter and IP sim, there it is. Um, but I think importantly, um, to, just, to, just to round off, is that um, it starts at the top, um, not just at the top of the organisation, but at the top of your, of your, of your body as well, in, in the mind. Um, and don't just focus on redesigning existing products. Um, try and imagine yourself on a beam of light, travelling at, at the speed of light, um, as Einstein did. And I think that's about it. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>